and welcome to What Are You Saying? Hashtag Ways, where we talk about topics in the news as it affects us all. So you're probably wondering, who is this teenager on my screen? Well, this is a teen special, so the adults can have a much needed vacation. So for the next three days, the teens are taking over. I'm Yasun Basharu, a second year student at the African Leadership Academy, and I'm joined by my amazing co-hosts, Ite and Alpha. <laughs> so, Ite, while we're doing our makeup, we were talking about you going to university. Yeah. Um, how are you feeling about that? I'm super excited. You know, moving on to this next phase in my life, higher mm -hmm. education. I know a lot of people are very scared of moving on, but I'm really, really excited to hit it head on, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, Alpha, same question for you. I know that you're also moving on to that new chapter of your life. Yeah, I think all of us are in that stage right now. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it has been a roller coaster ever since I graduated from secondary school on the 1st of July. Everything has been directed towards where I'm going to go for university. Mm -hmm. I think it's, as an international student here, yeah, it is difficult because, I don't know, the process is just so cumbersome for you to mm. be able 100%. to 100%. 100%. Measure. So we're still pushing and then all of our efforts is just going towards making that reality a success. That's really amazing. <laughs> so, how are you guys feeling about giving the adults an insight into the mind of a teen, or as my mom loves to put it, Gen Z? I don't know, for me, my mom has been about this getting <laughs> used on the camera for so long. So, I think <laughs> as she's watching us now, she's like, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think it's pretty good. Definitely. Now. And yeah. also, as Nigerian youth, I don't think Nigerian Gen Z get enough um, yeah. airtime. You know, mm -hmm. we're not really put out there. So, yeah. this is a really great experience to yeah. put Gen Z out there. Yeah. And, you know, it's yeah. the first, I think it's the first time it's ever been done. So, yes. we're making yes. history. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, you guys all look really fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Um, so, pretty much as we talked about giving the world a glimpse into the mind of Gen Z and everything like that. So, let's move on. Welcome to a captivating journey into the heart of justice and fairness, where the gravel of truth strikes with authority and skills of balance tip toward righteousness. Today, in conjunction with Enough is Enough Nigeria, we embark on an enlightening voyage as we unveil the intricate workings of the Nigerian judiciary, an essential pillar of our democratic society. So today we're going to be... So, the judiciary is one of the three arms of our government, along with the executive and legislative arms. Of the three tiers of government, there are only three courts at the federal and state levels. There are no courts at the local government level. So the structure of the Nigerian judiciary is split into two, federal and state. In the federal, there's the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, Federal High Court, National Industrial Court, and Code of Conduct Tribunal. In the state, state high courts, customary courts, magistrate courts, and Sharia courts in states with Sharia laws. So the function of the judiciary is interpretation of laws, interpret and clarify laws to ensure proper implementation. Two, identification of disputes. Courts hear and resolve disputes between individuals, organizations, and government ent entities while ensuring fairness and justice in these legal proceedings. So to continue with the functions of the judiciary, first of all, there's a judicial review, and which is to review the actions of the executive and the legislative arms of government to ensure that they are in accordance with the constitution. Furthermore, there's a protection of fundamental human rights, and that is to prevent the abuse of power and to safeguard citizens' fundamental rights, such as freedom of speech, religion, and association. It also provides remedies to individuals whose rights have been violated. Also, on the functions of judiciary, there is ensuring accountability, and that is to hold individuals and entities accountable for their actions. It combats corruption and ensures the rule of law prevails. Go on. Um, it is designed to operate independently to maintain its impartiality and integrity, Judges are expected to make decisions based on the law and not to be influenced by external pressures. The judiciary plays a vital role in Nigeria's democratic system and its independence is crucial for maintaining a fair and just society. So, it's the responsibility of citizens to know what falls under the purview of the judiciary for proper accountability. So today we're going to be discussing the feasibility of molding moral leaders. Is corruption born or bred? Here's what we found as today's quote. W.E. Deming said a bad system will beat a good person every time. What do you guys think about that? 
word. Like, my mom usually tells the story of this um, person that she had as a classmate, I think it was when she was in secondary school. Mm -hmm. And then this guy was like the brightest guy in his class. Mm -hmm. Always coming first, everybody wanted to be his girlfriend. And all <laughs> and then, I don't know, from my mom's viewpoint, my mom is a very reserved person. So yeah. she just like observed him as he went on. Eventually, I guess they split ways because of the Sharia crisis in the North at the time. Yeah. And then when she met him years later, apparently he had joined some bad gangs and like met him, uh -uh. like fallen victim to the influence of many people that mm. were virtuous people. And then when she met him again, after so long, he was like a completely different, different person. person. So I think I completely agree with that statement that says a bad system will beat a good person mm -hmm. every single time, especially mm -hmm. in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, you also hear um hear stuff like um people who are CEOs, MDs, and Nigerian um businesses like look for better um lifestyles um outside of the country, like in the UK, and then you see them and they're working as cleaners, as yes. janitors, mm. like someone who held such a high position back in your home country. The system beat you. You yeah. went abroad looking <laughs> for yeah, yeah, looking yeah. for a better <laughs> um lifestyle, but here you are starting from the bottom, starting from the beginning. Mm. Yeah. So there's very heavy discourse on whether or not you can be a truly ethical, honest, and moral leader in a nation. Some argue that this is because the system in itself corrupts leaders. So today we'll be discussing the art of molding moral leaders. Is corruption born or bred? Essentially, this may or may not become a nature versus nurture discussion. But first, let's take a break to see what we found in the news. You are still watching Ways. So now we are joined by Izine from America. Izine, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. We're glad that the distance wasn't yeah. a problem. Sincerely speaking. <laughs> so, um, let's get started with you. What do you have for us today in the news? Okay, so in slightly more depressing news, a flood has ravaged the state of Tarawa which has led to a lot of residents either losing property and having to evacuate them for their safety. Wow. And then we also have some more news in relating to uh, politics. For example, the President's Tribunal may no longer take place and the presidential Tribunal may no longer validate um, Peter B and his Vice President as well. For the double nomination, mm -hmm. and that will have a long lasting impact on the state of politics in Nigeria today. And so that's what I have in the news. Lots and prayers to those who are suffering from the Taraba floods, and we wish them all the best. We wish them all the best indeed. Thank you so much, Izine. Alpha? Well, before I jump into what I have for the news, I would like to again extend my um, condolences to the people in Taraba because the thing is, you guys may not know, but then I'm, I'm in Northern and I'm from Adamawa State. And then Taraba is like directly beside us. So it's rough knowing that the people that you call your people are suffering from things like this because mm. you lack the basic infrastructure to combat it. Yeah, anyway, to so what I have in the news, I'm taking my news from The Guardian and the headline says, Niger, <laughs> military succumbs to dialogue, says coup in Nigeria's interests. So one week after the expiration of the ultimatum, it got from the oh, one week after the expiration of the ultimatum that it got from the economic community of West African states, the ECOWAS, the hunter that overthrew Nigeria's president or Niger's president rather, Mohamed Bazoum, on July 26, 2023, has justified the change of government in the country while also stating its readiness for dialogue. So mm -hmm. now you guys, in case you may not know, mm -hmm. this is basically what's going on in Niger, to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, Tinubu, as he became president, he decided that he wanted to move on to bigger things, and then he became the chairman of the ECOWAS, right? And then as a person in that vital position, it is your responsibility to make sure that all of the countries within that organization are sorted out, mm -hmm. right? So basically, Niger is trying to secede from France, cut their ties with France, like many mm -hmm. other Francophone countries in the West African region. And then France was essentially trying to get the ECOWAS to stop them from trying to break away from their own community. And then it's very funny to me because why would an African community 
that has gone through that kind of colonial depression mm. wants to stop another African community from, from the, breaking away yeah. from the same definitely, thing. Definitely. So when I saw this story and I was like, okay, fine, do you, Atinubu gave them through the ECOWAS a one week grace period that after this week, we're going to take military action if you guys don't stop what you're doing. And then I was really scared because Nigeria is not in the states where it's to one hundred percent. You guys remember in the Biafran War, nineteen sixty-seven to nineteen seventy, it was people my age that they Going were sending out, out there conscripted yeah. to go and fight wars. And I'm like, do you really want to do that right now? Especially since a good amount of the Nigerian population is from Nigeria. Exactly. Yeah. Do you expect yeah. people to fight against their want, own people? Exactly. And so, there's no way you're taking Gen Z <laughs> out of the Gen Z. Gen Z. <laughs> no. <laughs> None of my friends who are watching this right now are going to pack up their bags and say, yes, I'm going to fight war for Nigeria. Mm. That shouldn't even be fighting a war in the first place. First place. Yeah. So, sincerely speaking, I give glory to God <laughs> <laughs> that this has turned to just dialogue because I'm not ready for violence yeah. right now. And as we should not be. We should not be. <laughs> um. Okay, so my news is taken from the Vanguard. The headline is, First Lady hosts Super Falcons at the Villa. The First Lady Senator Oluwemi Tinubu is currently hosting members of the Nigerian female football team, the Super Falcons, at the Presidential Villa Abuja. The Super Falcons crashed out of the ongoing FIFA Women's World Cup, being co-hosted by Australia and New Zealand. They lost through penalties to the English team last Monday, August the 7th. We are so, so proud of our Super Falcons we team. Are. Like, I feel like no one <laughs> expected them to it's reach nice that stage, really but they really made us na- proud. They really made Nigerians proud. And as a football fan myself, uh. yeah, so I'm just really <laughs> excited. I know they're greater things. In the next four years, we'll see them in the semifinals. Yes. You know? Good. Yeah, yes. So. Um, okay, so in other lighter news, it's National Creamsicle Day, a day where we celebrate the delicious frozen desserts. So the creamsicle was made in 1905 by 11-year-old Frank Epperson, who experimented with putting fruit juice around vanilla ice cream. That's an odd wow. mix, but if it works, it works. <laughs> so on this special day, grab yourself a refreshing popsicle and enjoy. So what do you guys think about this creamsicle? Would you try a creamsicle? No. <laughs> I mean, did you say juice around vanilla ice cream? Oh, yeah, <laughs> but like if there's a whole day for it, I'm assuming that it works. Then it again, to. there's a whole day for a lot of things in this world. I mean, if you I, I, can't, say, I cannot okay, argue with let's that. Let's hear from Ezine. Yeah. <laughs> Would you try a creamsicle? I've tried one before. Are you serious? Are you serious? How was it? <laughs> it was definitely... It was definitely a taste sensation. Mm. It was uh, definitely quite boring. But I didn't enjoy it particularly, but I can see why some people would. But well, it just wasn't for me. That's a very diplomatic yeah. answer. Yeah. And we yeah. appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll see you after the break.